Hi everybody, uh, Dr. Lefkoff here with an installment today of Intermediate Microeconomic Theory, and today we're going to take a first look at our uh, baseline oligopoly model known as the Corno duopoly game. Uh, specifically in this portion of the installment, we're going to show you how to transform uh, a more complicated oligopoly problem with many firms into a basic monopoly problem that you can solve as if you're just uh, one firm. So we're going to simplify the problem. Uh, there's a couple things that will be helpful for you to recall uh, as we go through this. The first is how to solve a basic monopoly profit maximization problem. Uh, the second thing you should know uh, is how to apply the concept of a Nash equilibrium. So hopefully you've seen the prisoner's dilemma game. And hopefully you remember how we find the Nash equilibrium in a mixed strategy game by plotting the best response functions and finding where they intersect. Uh, and last but not least, the definition of the residual demand curve. Uh, recall we discussed this concept in second degree pricing and perfect competition. Uh, this will also be useful for us and will really be our first tool that we encounter today. Okay, so we're going to use these concepts to transform a more complicated oligopoly model into a basic uniform pricing monopoly model. Okay, so the model we're going to work with today is going to be very simple. I have a linear demand curve. I have a constant marginal cost, meaning there's no fixed cost if marginal cost is equal to average cost. Uh, and this is consistent with the constant returns to scale technology. Okay, so here's our linear demand curve. Okay, there's our marginal cost function. Okay, we can also plot the residual demand, or I'm sorry, the marginal revenue curve, uh, which has twice the slope of the original demand curve. Um, and we can also then solve for both a perfectly competitive and monopoly uh, allocation. So recall in perfect competition, uh, the price is driven a marginal cost. So we can uh, we know what the price is. We can plug that into the inverse demand curve and solve for Q to find the volume of trade under perfect competition. Uh, and for the monopoly, we know the uh, first order condition is marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So setting those equal, uh, we can find the quantity traded under monopoly. We see the monopoly restricts the output by, uh, by 50% of what the competitive firm produces. And we can plug that quantity into the demand curve uh, to find the monopoly price, which is just the average of uh, that choke price, which is the demand curve intercept A and the marginal cost C. Uh, and this result uh, is sensitive to the model being nice and linear and that marginal cost function being flat. Um, so uh, what did we do so far? We've characterized now the extreme points of the market spectrum. Here's our monopoly outcome. Here's our perfectly competitive outcome. So we can look at these extreme ends of the spectrums here. And our objective today uh, in the later segment is going to be to plot the oligopoly outcome on this spectrum. Okay, so the setup of our duopoly model is as follows. We're going to have two firms in the short run. Uh, they're going to be selling identical products, and they're going to be playing a simultaneous move game, and we'll relax this assumption later to look at dynamic interaction. Uh, the firms are going to decide as their strategies what quantities they're going to produce. So the firms are going to each choose Q1 and Q2 simultaneously, which is going to determine the total market output Q. Uh, and then the market price is going to clear at the same price for all units, so some uniform price P through the inverse demand curve, uh, and again, reason being that the products are exactly identical, so we're not talking about Pepsi and Coke. We're talking about two firms that are selling the same generic soda, uh, and any rational consumer then would only be willing to pay the market clearing price for that, not anything higher. Okay, identical uh, and constant marginal cost equal to average cost. So this model is identical to what we just looked at. We're just adding one more firm, uh, and the firms are competing now by setting output not setting prices, and this is an important element of the Corno model, is that the firms are competing by setting quantities. We'll look at another model later on where the firms compete by setting prices, but this is going to be our first model. Okay, I mentioned that the residual demand curve was an important element here, so we're going to ask ourselves from firm one's perspective, if firm two produces some amount of output, uh, how much of the demand curve is left over for firm one? Okay, so we saw this concept. This is very similar to what we had done under second degree pricing. Right, and we'll just do a very quick numerical example. If, let's suppose firm 2 produces 10 units. Okay, then I can actually take that 10, plug it right into the demand curve, and look at how much of the demand is left over from one, firm 1's perspective. All right, you'll notice if Q2 goes up to 20, then the residual demand curve for firm 1 now is 80 minus Q1. If Q goes up to 30 for firm 2, then the residual demand curve left for firm 1 is 70 minus Q1. So the thing to notice here is as firm 2's output increases, the demand curve intercept for firm one's residual demand curve is actually decreasing. And we can see this diagrammatically here. We plugged in some output for firm two. Okay, so everybody above that price has bought the first Q2 bar units, and everybody to the right of Q2 bar is then uh, forming firm one's residual demand, which we can uh, plot uh, right up against the axis there. Uh, so you'll notice here, it looks like the residual demand has shifted in a little bit. How far has it shifted? Well, 
it shifted in by actually exactly uh, the amount of output that the other firm had produced, which matches our intuition, right? As the other firm's output went up, we saw the demand curve intercept for the residual demand curve on firm one had actually uh, gone down and was shifting in, okay? So uh, the question remains now, given this residual demand curve, what is the best response of firm one in terms of the quantity that he's gonna choose to try to maximize profit? So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take firm two's output of Q2 into account, and we're gonna figure out the optimal Q1 that maximizes profits along the residual demand curve for the first firm. Okay, so just recall that the residual demand curve in this model is just the, uh, I'm sorry, the residual marginal revenue curve is just the residual demand curve with twice the slope, and that this assumption's um, sensitive to the demand curve being linear, so we can exploit that here. Okay, so here's all we've done. We've looked at firm one's residual demand curve. I can now compute firm one's marginal revenue curve that corresponds to his residual demand curve. Uh, and then it's essentially gonna be business as usual. We can just solve a basic monopoly problem, right? So we've transformed the duopolis problem into a basic monopoly problem, uh, which means for us, it's business as usual. We're gonna produce along that residual demand curve uh, until the marginal revenue of that last unit equals the marginal cost of production. Right, so nothing is really different uh, in terms of what the solution of this intermediate step in the oligopoly model looks like. Right, So only thing that's different here is to get to this monopoly problem. We substituted the other firm's output into the demand curve. We looked at how much was left over. This is that red residual demand line here. And then we computed the marginal revenue curve just like we would for a normal monopoly problem. And we're going to produce until the marginal revenue of that last unit equals the marginal cost. And you'll notice here that I've actually labeled that output BR1 because it is the best response of firm one to the output level of firm two. It's the output level that firm one would choose that gives them the highest possible profit given the output Q2 bar. Okay, so we've derived a partial solution to the duopolis problem in the context of uh, duopolies that are competing by setting output as the strategic variable. Okay, uh, and essentially what we did is we were able to compute the conditional profit maximizing output, and this is conditional on not knowing um, what the other player's strategy is. Okay, uh, so from a game theoretic perspective, what we figured out today was essentially the best response of firm one. What was the output level uh, that maximized our profit, that gave us the highest payoff for this game, given the other player's strategy, which was some arbitrary uh, choice of the quantity for the other firm. Uh, what we're going to do in, in possibly a later video is to actually plot the best response functions for all the players. So we did, we can think about best response functions, not just for firm one, but we could also solve this from firm two's perspective to get generate a best response for firm two against firm one. Uh, and then the objective from that point forward would be to try to solve for the Nash equilibrium by finding the output levels uh, whereby both firms are playing mutual best responses uh, and essentially invoking that definition of the Nash equilibrium. Okay, and we're going to do this in the next video segment. So I hope you enjoyed that quick crash course into how to convert a basic duopoly problem in quantity competition uh, into a much simpler monopoly problem.